here we are at our next episode of Lift Off Journeys, and I'm here with Sergio Kopalev, a good friend of mine who I am thrilled was able to come on the show today. Hey, Sergio. Thank you for having me. It's very exciting. We're so excited to talk to you. Okay, so everybody here needs to know that Sergio is, first of all, one of the busiest men ever. He's always up to at least seven things at the same time. In addition, he's one of the funnest people that you ever get to hang out with. So if you ever run into this guy on the street, stop, hang out with him. He has great stories to tell. And that's why he's a perfect guest for this episode of Lift Off Journeys. We're going to hear a little bit about what Sergio is doing today, but more importantly about his journey of how he's got to where he is in life right now and why nothing is happenstance. It all happens for a reason. So Sergio, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about what you're doing today. You're very kind. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it, it's it's interesting. Like I do so many different things in so many different areas, and you know the joke is you know it's it's attention deficit, right? And uh, I've learned how to take my disability and and turn it into a superpower, right? And so you have to rem- you, you have to so sort of always keep that in mind that whatever makes you unique is makes you unique, right? Um, so you're very kind, uh, and yeah, if people run into me, most likely it's going to be in a Las Vegas casino now. Um, where I spend most of my time. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, but no, I live That's in Vegas now. Because you live there. Let, let's just hold on. Let's just interrupt and say it's because you live in Vegas now, not because yeah. you have a need to <laughs> not leave. Yeah, no, 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 to- yeah, totally. Because I live in Vegas. Uh, I mean, it, my my journey is, is sort of an interesting one. Like I came to the U.S. I don't look like the part, but I came to the U.S. as a refugee. I'm a first generation refugee. I was born in Soviet Russia. Uh, we were Jewish dissidents for a bit. My family is highly political. Um, you know, my grand my grandfathers had a much more interesting journey than I that I did ever because uh, my my great uncle you know fought with fought with with Lenin and against Stalin, and so and so when we came to the U.S. for me as a kid, it was a real shock because you know I, when I was in Russia, I was I was quite a Quite, quite idealistic about the fact that, you know, Soviet Russia was good. And then my whole world turned upside down where I learned that, no, no, that's all a lie. And and so I came to New York and lived in the hood. Eight of us lived in a one bedroom apartment uh, where, um, yeah, separated, the living room separated with a curtain. So my grandparents had, had the bedroom, my aunt, uncle, and my cousin had one half of the living room. And then we had the other half. Uh, my my parents and I, and so small family, um, and grew up really in, in in play like in in the type of poverty where it's just we don't talk about it in, in you know polite society. And fortunately for me, I was able to get out you know a little education, a little good luck, a little hard work. When you combine it all together, it, it produces results. Now, how old were you when you came over as a refugee? I was eight. We came in the 70s during the second wave of Russian immigrants. Jimmy Carter, good thing he did. You know, he made a deal with Brezhnev. Russia. So in the 70s, Russia had a horrible uh, famine. And so um, Brezhnev or um, um, I think I'm trying to think who I guess it was Brezhnev back then made a deal with Jimmy Carter where they he would allow Jews out of Russia to reunite with families that were separated during World War II. Um, And the idea was to go to Israel. And then when we all left Russia, we wound up in Austria, kind of in a holding spot. And and if somebody said, I want to go to Israel, you'd be on the next plane to Israel. So, but my grandmother, Israel in the 70s was having quite, quite a different, and my grandmother who's been through, she said, I've been through one war. I'm not doing another one. She, she, she went through World War II with two infant kids. And she said, I'm not, I'm not going to another war zone. And so we decided to come to the US. Then we had to apply to be, into the U.S. refugee program. So we had to spend a year while we were trying to get the U.S. to accept us because we had no documents, we had no money, we had no nothing. So um, we finally got here, um, we finally got here right before 1980 and um, moved you know, into sort of, we didn't even move to the Russian area of New York because it was too expensive. We moved into the hood uh, just because yeah. we didn't have anything. And then um, we eventually got we eventually, my mom got a job, my dad got a job. My dad did everything imaginable uh, at first, but then wound up working for Katz's Deli in in, in Manhattan on Houston Street, sent a salami to boy in the army. And so my dad made sandwiches for a living. So, I mean, 
uh, <clears throat> one of the things, so I'm pretty successful now, right? I, I, I have a day, I have a, I'm a vice president of a multinational consulting firm. Um, I came out of the big four. Uh, I came out of the, I was in the government first, then I came out of the big four in the government. You know, I ran a federal task force out of, out of Maine justice and I've spoken to con in front of Congress. And so fairly accomplished. And, and it's really interesting to think about like how I got here, right? Because I literally, we, we came from nothing, but that being said, I sometimes, you know, I, I do, I do a certain amount of media and talk to people and I teach college now. And so I always sort of talk about the fact that if you, if you put in hard work, you can make it. And in some ways I feel a little bit like an imposter when I say that, because while it's true, we came here with nothing, no English, no education, no, you know, American education. My grandmother was a physician in Russia. My grandfather was a PhD scientist in Russia with several patents. My mom, um, you know, taught college in Russia. So in some ways, while it's easy to say, yeah, I'm like a self-made man, you know, my dad made sandwiches for a living. The reality is my family has all been very successful. So in the, in the mindset, and this has really been, I knew what success looked like, right? Because uh, I don't really play golf or play or play baseball, but if you listen to golf players and if you listen to baseball players, what they'll tell you is unless you can see in your mind the bat coming in contact with the ball or the club coming in contact with the ball and that ball sailing over over the, the fairway, uh, you're never going to hit it. You're never going to hit a home run if you can't see that that ball coming in contact with that bat and then that that and then going over over the wall and I never really understood that until probably the last four or five years. But one of the things that my family has allowed, you know, allowed me to do is to know what success looks like, even if it's not in front of you, and then you can plot it. As people, when you stand up, you have to stand up with your head first. And so I'm a big believer that we create our own reality. And if you think it, if you build it, it will happen. Um, and so I really do, you know, physically it works that way. You can't stand up unless your head is, is, is the one that going up. And I think, you know, thematically or emotionally, you're never going to be successful un unless you can see your head moving up, unless you can see that bat coming in contact with that ball and you can see that ball going over the fairway or going over, you know, the wall at, at Wrigley field. And I think that's the key to, to success. Um, it, it's you know. fascinating that you take that all the way back to how successful your family was in Russia. My grandparents on my mom's side came over from Italy where they were very successful in the banking industry. And of course, here in the U.S., they were building a lot of the bridges and tunnels in Pittsburgh and doing a lot of day labor and putting lots of family members through schools and just paying for their support. But previously they had been, you know, very well to do. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think a lot of people go back to their lineage as much as they could to know that they were born into an incredible opportunity or a family that's already pre-laid the demonstration of success. And all they need to do is, as you said, you know, step, stand up, put your head first, envision it and move with it. So I love that. I think that's a great perspective. Yeah. And, and so I'm, as much like I have friends who are like, oh, my God, you know, look at what you've accomplished. Right. And 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 and, and I I don't know, I feel a little bit like an imposter. It's different than when you grew up in Appalachia and your parents couldn't read. And now you look at the and she's the CEO of, a you know, of a dot com and finished Harvard or whatever. Like that's impressive. Right. Because I I was a lot very fortunate that I had a successful family. So as much as it sounds like we came from nothing and I lived in poverty. So I just didn't want to be an imposter when we talk about it. But yeah, I grew up in poverty where, you know, where now it's all hipsters, but back then it was all section eight housing. It was, you know, it was a terrible crime ridden neighborhood that was controlled by gangs uh, because it just, it wasn't really suitable for, you know, for human, <laughs> human residents, but that's what the, that's just the neighborhood in Brooklyn that we we happen to move into, and and it's a, it's a great story that hey I came from the from the other side of the tracks, but the reality is is that fam my family at least gave me a little bit of a not financially but but sort of emotionally and intellectually they gave me the ability to see success and to know that success is there, right? Uh, and I think that's that yeah. says a lot, right? I, yeah. I think that so we value that. 
as you as you you know grew up here did you have an idea of what you wanted to be when you grew up are you one of the types of people that likes to explore everything did you follow a passion you know for a while i wanted to be a cashier because i liked cash registers <laughs> so we're all very grateful that i didn't go down that route permanently but i was a cashier for a while so i did live out my dreams i also wanted to be a veterinarian and i wanted to be a teacher and all these other things what did you want to be as you were growing up did you have an, so, an idea that's a great question not really so so i came so i came uh, you know sort of in, in elementary school and i and i was very little i've always been i'm 5 7 now but when I was really young, I was really little, you know, for my age. And so my, when I first came to the U.S. in fifth grade, it was awful. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. I got my ass kicked constantly. I got picked on by everyone in school. I couldn't, I didn't even know, like, I didn't know enough English to know when the kids were making fun of me. And so it was, it was horrible. And so I started a running with a local Hispanic street gang uh, for uh, because for protection, for survival. And then uh, I got in trouble, pretty, pretty substantive trouble when I was, um, I guess it was when I was just getting ready to go to high school. Um, and by that time, I was already kind of a baby gangster and, and a pretty bad guy. And when I got in trouble, fortunately, instead of going to juvie, they were going to put me in juvie till my 18th birthday. And that would have been bad. But fortunately, I went into a diversion program where um, it was the intended to divert at-risk youth instead of going to prison uh, to divert to try to see if we can make something ourselves. And it had two elements to it. One was the 4-H Wilderness Challenge, where they took us out into the woods and taught us how to repel and confidence courses and do all this outdoorsy stuff, which as an inner city kid, I was like, yeah, it's fine. It gets me out. And like, you know, I don't have to be in Brooklyn for, for you know, a weekend. But then the other part was the police explorer post. And the police explorer post, I got introduced to law enforcement. And I say this, that uh, in pretty much a few days, I met the biggest, toughest, uh, best equipped, best funded, best armed, uh, tightest gang in the city of New York, the New York City Police Department. And after that, I didn't want to be anything else but a cop. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm career law enforcement. I've always sort of felt like a cop. I liked who I was as a cop. My first job at high school, I was an EMT on a New York City ambulance, which I loved as well. Um, and it made me feel good. And I didn't want to be a victim. And so for me, a big drive of who I was and, and maybe even to do it today was the reason I wanted to be in law enforcement is because they were the ultimate. They, they ruled the streets. And I didn't. And so I was like, well, yeah, the gangsters like you're, you're protected. Like I didn't get my ass kicked once I started once I started with uh, with my friends, but the cops still messed with them, but nobody messed with the cops. So my goal from fairly young, I was never in trouble again. Um, I, I kept two jobs to pay restitution because I, there was there was some I had some issues from that. Um, I had some police officers who really took a, took a, an interest in me. Um, and uh, so I from a fairly young, you know, from, from high school years, I decided that I wanted to be in law enforcement because it was the toughest job, you know, that I could imagine where I would never be picked on. And I think that's been a driver for me for a very long time. Um, and then when I left law enforcement, um, I, and I came to San Diego, I got into consulting because I got recruited to it by, by a former boss's boss who was an FBI agent or an assistant director of the bureau and sort of stayed in that same field for quite a while. That's great. So do you feel like you were mentored by the police and different people? Yeah. The yeah. So uh, one of the sort of uh, one of my accomplishments when I was in law enforcement is um, is and my parents split. Like I, we, there's a lot of excuses people can come up with. Like my parents split and maybe that contributed to it a little bit. And, you know, my dad was kind of out of my life at that time. And then I got close to him when I when I finally grew, you know, became an adult. But um for me, it was really, you know, like their parents were like, oh my God, my kid is never going to accomplish anything. I'll give you my mother's phone number, right? Because if I could accomplish something as difficult as I was, anybody can. So yeah, there was a, there was a guy named Sergeant Don Amos um, who took a lot of interest in me and spent a lot of time with me. And I think that was a very positive male influence in my life. And so because of that, I sort of am who I am. 
Uh, but I also will, will credit my mother for, for my mother as a studious person. My dad was brilliant and never, and really made sandwiches for a living. Right. But he was from a street smart standpoint, he, he, he was a very street savvy kind of guy and who could really, he knew somebody, he knew somebody who could get anything. And that's very much me. Right. I've never met a stranger and my dad, and that's all that, all my dad, my mom might not have been as smart intellectually, but she was very accomplished. Because, you know, in, Ru in Russian, it sounds better, but basically some people accomplish things with their heads and some pe people accomplish things with their, with their behinds by sitting in a chair and doing it, right? And so I was very fortunate that, that I got both from my mother and from my dad. Um, and so, I, you know, once I figured out that, co that school was a good thing, it was great, right? But, you know, it is a lot of positive role models. A lot of it is drive. A lot of it is HGAD and I was never happy with anything and I was never focused on any one thing. And I just kept driving. And every time, you know, you reach the top of a mountain for whatever reason, I see the next, the next mountain and I want to climb that. Um, and so I don't, you know, so I was very fortunate that that drive was built into me from the time I was, I was little. Yeah, that's great. So you, you've built this whole career and it's been pretty phenomenal with some twists and turns along the way, but even today, <laughs> as a successful leader at a large company, you still enjoy other hobbies that get to kind of challenge you to think differently or follow your passions, right? Yeah, it, very much so. And, and and I don't know why that is, but yeah, I mean, and it all sort of, it sounds so odd, but it's all so sort of organic. Like I have, I have two startups that I'm help that I'm with my friends because I enjoy it, right? I have a, I have a travel right. startup, which is a kind of a big play called Viversi where um, diversity, we're building a community and marketplace where individuals can securely combine resources to achieve travel they couldn't on their own, right? It sort of combines the best of Meetup and, and uh, Airbnb um, in, into one, right? And then I have another startup, which is a spy school startup called Tradecraft Adventures, where we, we give people a chance to spend four days uh, all-inclusive living the life of a knock. <clears throat> right in the intelligence community, there's two types of spies. There is a there are case officers who train at Langley or or in Quantico, uh, or they train at the farm or in Quantico, um, and they're official. Like their their paychecks, they're generally associated with 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 the agency or the FBI. They're sworn agents. And then there's knots, which are non-official cover uh, folks who never touch, who never touch uh, an, the intelligence establishment, but they get trained in in safe houses and they then spend their life working for banks and universities and different things, but they have their career, right? They're non-official cover operatives, which are their real spies. And so um, all of our, we give you that experience of being a knock for four days where you get to live. I, I love live both up. of those companies. I, I think yeah. they're both brilliant, you know, especially we versus, uh, you know, my husband Vince is, trying to plan a vacation and, and was looking at, if you go individually, this is how much it costs. If everybody pulled their resources together, look what we could do. And, and there's such a need for that right now, especially now that kind of COVID bans are lifted and everybody can work remotely or hybrid and, and get to explore that. That's cool. And the spy yeah. thing, it sounds amazing to me. It, well, it really you, does, you'll be, so. you and Vince, we'll have, we'll have you and Vince that we, we're doing it in two places, one in Louisville, Kentucky, and one, in um, uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada, and so um, we'll have you out. <clears throat> I when I was in law enforcement, I spent I spent some time undercover, and so when I was undercover, my my case officer was a guy named Terry Rancorn, who's a legendary undercover guy. Who spent you know Terry has trained pretty much every you see the FBI has put out for the last twenty years, <clears throat> and ran the both the FBI's um, ran one of the uh, undercover training programs. Um, and also used, used to work in their black bag squad, just an amazing, amazing guy. And we've been lifelong friends since we worked together. Um, and then one day while I was in Mexico and bored on vacation, really all of these things happened because, you know, after three days I was like, oh, okay, I've, I've drank enough mojitos and smoked enough cigars where there's gotta be something fun to do. And I just started playing around and we came up with this trade craft adventures concept because I remember having that experience of being undercover and living another life and it was kind of exciting but most people don't get that experience and those skills that you learn 
um, have a value to it. You know, one of the things that we talked about, like Tradecraft, like it's fun because we, for four days you get to experience another life, right? You still you, but we teach you, uh, and you you live the life of a knock. Well, what would happen if you if you weren't, you know, a celebrity and you were you were uh, you were a knock, right? And then uh, and that's fun, but the reality of it, there's a reason why retired spies are in such high demand, right? There's a reason why my in my corporate job in my day job. I get paid a lot of money to do what I do because of the skills that I've acquired during my time in the government. And that goes across the board. We have, you know, we have a group of mentors that, 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 we, that are going to be our <clears throat> mentors for, for, our, for, for the, for the clients that are pretty amazing. And they're all very accomplished, very successful people. So you got to ask yourself, why is it that spies are in such high demand and are so successful, whether they, whether in the government work or in the private sector, and the reality is that having these skills help people get better jobs. It helped because those skills are useful in business and sales and, and other things. It helps them in, in interpersonal interactions, right? It, it, and, you know, it helps you talk to the opposite sex. It helps you be confident enough and to ask the right questions. It helps you know when people are lying to you, right? All are useful things for social interactions, dating, you know, personal relationships, whatever you want to call it. And then number three, it helps you be safe, right? So the goal of this training is to have fun, right? It's four days of fun, but I really focus all of our mentors on the fact that we are, we are looking to give skills to our clients that will serve them beyond just the four-day adventure. Like you go on a cruise, it's great, but then you come home, all you have is the pictures. Here, you get actual skills that you can use going forward to you know, get a better job, have better relationships, and then stay safer where you know how to spot a, a secret camera when you check into an Airbnb. And you recognize that when you check in a hotel and you think it's your space, there's a hundred people have access to your room. And be aware, being aware of those things and knowing what it looks like when you're leaving the mall during Christmas time and you think somebody's, all of a sudden you recognize that somebody's following you, right? Now they're not following you because, because they're, you know, they're Russian spies, and, right? But they might be following you because they want to mug you. And so it gives yeah. you those skills teaches you what to do if that happens and how to avoid that and, and so on. That's so fascinating. And when, you know, when your friend gets tradecraft ready to go mainstream, let me know, I'll have you on the TV show because it's an incredibly helpful and useful, I think, product and experience. Yeah. We just, at the, except at, at the, at the risk of being too pitchy, we just, um, we just, we just launched, <laughs> we just launched our website officially. And so we're starting to, our first adventure is set for uh, the in per We have a couple of different, uh, we have a way for, we have the in-person sort of the, the flagship adventure. And the first one yeah. is going to be beginning of April in Las Vegas. Um, but we also have an online training component because there's a lot of folks that might want to have that experience and might want to have the training, but they just don't have the resources to go to Las Vegas for four days. And it's inexpensive. I mean, it's, it's a $5,000 uh, vacation. And so they yeah. might not have that, that ability. So we have an online component. We have an on-demand component. So there's different ways for people to get involved. So, yeah, we're pretty, awesome. we're pretty excited. Yeah, we should talk about that more later. I have, I have a completely random question for you. So uh, there was that movie a few years ago, and I can't remember what it was called, but it was about Chuck Berry, who was uh, supposedly a knock that was also a TV show host from the gong show. And it, and there was a whole movie that followed his life where he supposedly had this double life where, you know, by day he's TV show host on the weekends at night, he's doing, he's running all of these spy campaigns and even gets caught. I don't know if you saw that movie or not. I'm curious if you did, if you think, you know, if it's real, but you're saying no, so you didn't see it. So now I, I, I didn't see it. It's interesting. It's, I mean, the, things that got to happen most of the time, right? Most of the time, a Knox wind up being serving overseas and have specific focus and specific missions, right? Uh, they work in, they, they work for Citibank um, in, in, you know, in Moscow, right? Because their job is to develop local, you know, intelligence, local assets. Uh, just like like one of our mentors, um, the part of the program is a guy named Jack Barsky, who's a who's actually the the American word is knock. The the Russian term for it is illegal, right? So if you've seen the show The Americans, Jack did that yeah. for ten years during the Cold War, 
right? He was a he was a he was German, um, just like the just like the characters actually. I think uh, in the Americans he was German. Um, he was recruited by the Stasi because he was a scientist. He was a chemist, and he had the right ideological outlook in life. He was a dedicated communist, uh, and he got re recruited by the Stasi to work on behalf of the KGB in the U.S. So he came to the U.S., assumed a fake identity, and lived in it for ten years, and sent coded messages back to Russia, and and you know traveled using dead drops and fake passports, and all the all the things that we were going to teach. But um, he had a very specific mission, and then to under to really report on American culture, because Russia had a misunderstanding of kind of how this country worked. They figured it out, right? So if 2016 and and 2020 taught us anything is that, that Russia's got is is got it figured out now about what we're all about and how we function. So it's it's interesting. Um, so I don't know if Chuck Berry was was a knock. I don't know if I would if really I would utilize a TV show host because I don't know how much access they have to 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 individuals right. with with proper intelligence. If you watch the movie Argo, Argo is based on a true story where the CIA yeah. set up a movie company in order to to rescue um, hostages. So yeah. uh, I would use Argo more of an, of an example than um, than Chuck Berry, but I'm I'm at, now I'm going to watch that movie and see what like they're going to have to watch the movie. Yeah. Yeah, Alaska. it was just fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. Well, I know Alaska. we're almost up on time, <laughs> which is yeah, which is crazy. Well, and I'll yeah. report back to you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I want to know if he was really a spy because you watch this whole movie and and the people, of course, people behind the scenes. It's the standard, you know. After that kid you know, robbed the house. I knew he was always a bad boy. I saw him not being nice to the cat after it was done, you know, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. That's yeah. it. I, so your your journey, Sergio, has been driven by security, success, safety, and creating a world that's a better place, which I think is a phenomenal journey. And it's great to see that it's really been consistent your, your entire life. You've done different adventures and you're always involved with different adventures, but they've all evolved around, you know, a couple of key principles. I think that's very cool. Yeah. And I, and I honestly think, and, and, and this is sort of a philosophical thing and I'm not the deepest philosophical guy. Like that's not what I'm known for. Right. I work hard, but if, but in recent history, in recent years, I've been a little bit more philosophical. And I will tell you that one of the things is, is that like, I don't know what you, I'm not a religious person, right? I'm Jewish, but more cultural than religious. And I will tell you is it doesn't matter what you call um, whatever power of the universe, right? Some people call it, call it uh, Jesus. Some people call it the universe, Selena. Some people call it um, whatever life force, right? Some people call it Yahweh and, you know, Muhammad. It doesn't really matter what you call it, but there's some, there's some sort of order to the universe that that if you put in good things into the universe good things come back to you right and and really like i really struggle with the fact is that true why do good things happen to bad why do good things happen to bad people and why do bad things happen to good people and and in my personal thing like i don't know if any of that is true like the that the fact that, that if you do good things the universe will reward you but what i will tell you in my experience is that if you approach life with that in from that direction it doesn't matter if it's true it just makes your life better right? It doesn't matter whether it's real or whether it's just our own fictional self-belief that when I'm, when I feel good about myself, good things happen, right? And ultimately that's, that's, I think why I've been successful because I have this sort of a casual relationship and because it costs nothing to be nice to somebody. Like that's the reality is, right? We, by being nice to somebody else, it costs me nothing, right? It doesn't, it, it, it like just saying, something nice there's no cost there's no opportunity cost there's no there's no time cost you just you'd be nice right being nice to the to the waitress being nice to the to the clerk being nice to somebody that that you're sitting next to on an airplane right so it costs nothing to be nice and ultimately what you get out of it is 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 is, is a great benefit and so overall like my i think that a lot of my success be attributed number one to other people i've been extremely fortunate that that folks have been very helpful, and I think the reason folks are helpful is because I try to be nice to people, 
right? Not, I don't always succeed, but, you know, and, but, but, and that's, if I, if I could leave one thing, it is the fact that it costs you nothing to be kind. Um, and if everybody's kind to everybody else, we'll have a much better world. I love that. It's such a great note to end on. Thank you so much for being our guest on the Up Journey. Thank we'll you so you. much. Thank you for having me. It's very flattering. Like I, it really is. It's very, very flattering. Absolutely. All right. Bye. Bye. This podcast show was produced by the amazing team at Castos Productions. They take all of the worry off of my team's plate. All we do is record and they take it from here. Whether you're looking for help with your audio or video podcast on YouTube, Castos Productions is the only company to partner with. If you are looking for production help, head on over to castos.com forward slash services. Don't forget to tell them the genie sent you. They've got a special promotional offer waiting for you. Thank you.